This is part two of the three-part interview with Norman Bodeg, the godfather of Lean. In part one, Norman discussed becoming socially responsible, the basis of JIT and the Toyota production system, and paying attention to your Jiminy Cricket. In this session, we'll hear about Shigo Shango's Green Book, Microbanks, and the world's greatest charity. So back in 1979, I started with a newsletter productivity, and it grew very, very fast. I had 3,000 subscribers almost overnight. I'll tell you one amazing story here, which I love, because I started with a newsletter, then I want to run a conference. And the reason I want to run a conference is because if I do, I will get 40 speakers. These 40 speakers will submit papers, and I'll get 40 papers that I can use in my newsletter to acquire information on US productivity. That was my idea. And then I get a call from a man called Joe Schneider. What an amazing man. This is the only time in my life it's ever happened. And I should do the same thing as Joe Schneider. I really should, we should all do this. We should all call people that we like and tell them, how can I I help you? Joe Schneider called me. He says, Norman, I'm an independent consultant. In fact, the chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank is one of my clients. And Joe said, I love your newsletter, Norman. How can I help you? How can I help you? How can I help you? And I said, Joe, I'm going to run a conference. And at the conference, I need three people. Maybe you could help me. I need a CEO of a major corporation. I have no contacts with them. I, need, I want to get a labor leader somebody in charge of a union, and I want to get a politician, somebody from Washington. And Joe said, Norman, okay, give me, give me a little time. I'll get back to you. A week later, Joe calls back and he says, Norman, I got you Michael Rose, chairman of Holiday Inns, the largest hotel chain in the world to keynote your conference. He says, Norman, I, have, I got Don Eflin. Don Eflin is the second in command of the UAW. He's in charge of the Ford Motor Company account. And then miraculously, I also got Stan Lundin, who was a congressman from upstate New York. I had three key people. I felt that if I had these three key people, I could attract 40 speakers. And I did. I got 40 speakers from industry to speak for me. I ran my first conference. It was a tremendous success. Amazing. We ran it at the Waldorf Astoria, of all places. They even gave me credit. That's another long story. And the, of course, from the conference, I had my 40 papers, I had my 40 articles, and then we just continued, you know, in, in the beginning process of studying Japan, what is Japan doing? Well, I went to Japan. There's Joe Giorai, who spoke at Industry Week. I, I w- approached him at the end of his talk, and I said, Joe, you bring people from Japan to America would you let me bring people from America to Japan? Would you help me set up a study mission? And he said, Norman, we'll do it. And he did. And I attracted 19 top executives, presidents of companies to go with me to Japan on a two-week study mission to find out what the Japanese were doing to be so productive. I had no idea really what they were doing. I was very nervous because I had no idea. And hopefully I'm bringing these people to Japan. I was hoping we're going to find out. And we did. And of course, on the first trip, I find what Toyota was doing. This was a miraculous experience. I found out what Toyota was doing. I started to meet great managers in Japan because every company you visit, and we visited 16 (laughs) companies in two weeks, they get up and present to me. And then I'd go over to them if I liked the presentation to talk more with them. And on that first trip, Ryuji Fukuda was vice president of Sumitomo Electric, and Fukuda gave us a great speech. He spoke about something called on-era training, on-era training. This is very similar to what we know as Jidoka. What he said is the best time to learn. Listen, please, everyone. The best time to learn is when you make a mistake. A mistake is a jewel. In fact, one of the books I wrote, which is called The Happiest Company to Work For, and I I recommend you all buy it. It's wonderful. 
the happiest company to work for, they would pay everybody $6 for every mistake that you made. Fukuda would say, but he would say, Mr. The Yamada President, if you make a mistake, you get $6, but never make the same mistake again. Well, in order not to make the same mistake again, Fukuda came up with the idea of on error training. And that means when the worker discovers a problem, they discover a mistake or a problem, they stop working. Stop, just like the doka. They call over their team, and they had rules. One rule was no speak. The supervisor and manager can't speak. You put pressure on the worker to discover how to solve the problem. The team that the worker was part of, and it's important to be part of a team, maybe five or seven people on the team, and they would study what caused the problem so it never would occur again. This is a wonderful thing, which is called on-era training. I got very excited, and I walked over for Fukuda. I said, I like it very much. And then for Fuku- two things happened. I invited Fukuda to come and speak at my first conference, and he did. And also, Fukuda said he wrote a book. And I said, I'll publish a book in English. I had no idea, Chris, what I was saying. I never published a book before. I was doing a newsletter. I was running a conference, but I never, uh, and I, now I'm doing, doing study missions in Japan, never published books before. But I said, I'll publish your book. And it was the first book that I published, and it was great. Subsequently, since I learned how to do a study mission, I did it again. But without the help of Japan Management, so Japan Productivity Center, I learned how to do it on my own. And on the second trip, six months later, I also attracted about, the well, next time I attracted about 15 people, not 19, a little bit less. And on that trip, I was with John, Jack Warren. He became the president of Omark Industries. He had 11 plants in America. And the two of us found Shigeo Shingo on the second trip. Somebody, a Mr. Ota at Nippon Denso, who gave a wonderful talk on Just in Time, um, gave us a sheet of paper, and on the sheet of paper it said, the study of the total production system from an engineering viewpoint. It's called Shingo's Green Book. I recommend everybody listening to me today read Shingo's Green Book. It's the heart of lean. It's the heart of the total production system. It's a marvelous book to read, to really teach you the basics of what we call lean. Now, lots of people are doing lean. I didn't coin the term lean. I was one of the first to discover it, but I didn't call lean. Womack was smarter than me. James Womack, uh, one of his students called it lean, and he wrote a book on it, you know, the machine that saved the world, and he promoted the word lean and became very popular. The only problem is we don't really do it. We don't really do it well. Even now, it's 30 years later. We don't do it as well as we should. We're missing some really key elements, Chris. And I'll explain one of those key elements that I think we're missing. In addition to finding Shingo, I also discovered Ono. Taishi Ono was vice president in charge of production at Toyota. He was in charge of all production at Toyota. What Ono did, what we're not doing, Ono would demand the impossible. Ono would go out to a a manager. He has 10 people working for him. And Ono said, I want you to do it with seven. He had no idea if they can do it with seven. But he knew if he didn't ask, they would never do it. And this is what happens in America. We're doing lean, but we don't ask people to do the impossible. We follow Ono's seven ways that we do. You know, eliminating inventory and et cetera but we don't demand the impossible. We don't take the power of the CEO. This is interesting. What do we mean by empowerment? We talk about it, but we don't do it. One day I get a call from Jack Katzen. Jack Katzen is a senior vice president with a company called AFCO. AFCO is about a $2 billion company then. And Jack said, Norman, I heard about you uh, and you live in the same city as me. Greenwich, Connecticut. And he said, Norman, I want you to teach me all about quality. There's a new quality movement. And I said, Jack, I'm very happy to do it. This was very funny because Jack said, what are you going to charge me? I want you one day a month to teach me about quality. I said, give me time to think about it. I'll get back to you. I called my nephew who worked for a large accounting firm at the time. And I said, 
what did your senior partner get when he works with top corporations? And he said, they get 2000 a day. Okay, sounds good to me. I mean, I would have charged them $200 a day. That's where my head was. But I called back Jack and I said, Jack, how about $2,000 a day? And Jack said, that sounds fair. This was amazing. And then I went to Jack and started to teach him quality. Then Jack says, look, if we're going to get quality, we have to go out to our companies. We own 10 companies. Let's go out and talk to the president of each of those companies. And we did. My first time in my life, I got on a corporate jet because AFCO owned corporate jets. Beautiful way to go, by the way. (laughs) And we take a corporate jet and we fly up to one of the subsidiaries, one of the companies they own, and we spoke to the president and his senior staff. And Jack said the following. He didn't say, I want you to write a quality plan. He said, Don, who was the CEO of AFCO, the boss of the CEO that we're talking in the subsidiary, he said, Don wants you to write a quality plan and he wants you to deliver it to us in 30 days. I love that. That happens so rarely. Don knew if he asked, it might not get done. But if it comes from the president, the person has to follow it. And they did. We went to all 10 companies all around the the country, went to California, all over the place to these 10 countries. And we told every one of these leaders, Don wants you to write a quality. I don't even know if Jack told Don what he was doing. I don't even think that matters. As long as you're going in the right direction, you need the power to make things work. Funny part of this story. Well, let me continue. All presidents wrote this quality plan, and they sent it to Jack. Jack then replicated it, made 10 copies each 10 times, put it in a notebook, so every sent it back to the CEOs. So each CEO not only had their own plan, but they had the plan of every other president in the group. And then Jack said, study everybody's plan and rewrite yours using the strength of everybody else. This is such a simple and powerful mechanism if companies would do this, if companies would would do this. Okay, three years later or so, Jack becomes the Assistant Secretary of Defense in Washington. And he calls me and he says, Norman, come on down to the Pentagon. I want you to help. This was a funny moment in my life. I go to the Pentagon and Jack takes me into a room and the room is filled with generals and admirals. Now, I was in the Army for two years. I never saw a general, never saw an admiral. And now in front of me are all of these admirals and generals. And Jack says to them, I want you to meet Norman Bodek, the man who saved my company $400 million. I wish I had a copy of that to send out to the world because I was teaching them the power of quality. And we came up with this mechanism to draw it out, not to tell them what to do, but to draw it out of them. That's what a good manager should be doing. That's what a good teacher should be doing. Not teach, not telling people what to do, but drawing out from them the best that they can do and then empowering them to go ahead and do it. Ono was an amazing manager. Shingo one day, though, sits with me maybe three weeks before he died. Shingo had cancer, but his wife never told him. This was interesting. She never told him he had cancer. So he never stopped working. He would get on airplanes and fly to America to help me. He was such an amazing man. Three weeks later, he died. He went out to a client. His wife went with him. He was in a wheelchair. And at the client, he says, I don't feel well. She took him to the hospital and he died. Shingo said, though, to me, Norman, I know you're working with Ono's assistance, but I want you to recognize that Ono was absolutely ruthless and be careful because I think those people are the same. He was absolutely right. I won't get into that story too deeply. Oh, no, demanded the impossible for people. No excuses. One day, we're standing out in front of a warehouse at Toyota Gose, and the president is there of Toyota Gose. And, and Oh, no, was now the chairman of the company. He left Toyota, became the chairman of Toyota Tose, Gose. That's what they do in Japan. They wouldn't move Ono up to be president of Toyota. He was too rough. So they moved him over and made him chairman of Toyota Gose. And he says to the president, this warehouse, I want you to get rid of it. 
at Toyota, we do not have warehouses. I want you to make it into a machine shop. I want you to retrain everybody to be a mechanic. I'll give you one, one year to do it, and he walked away. He never told people how to do it. Never. He demanded people to do the impossible. That's what good management should do, Chris, is bring out the best for the people that work for them. And you do that by demanding from them that they grow. People have no idea what they're capable of doing. I'm going to talk about the Harada method a little bit later because this is a marvelous technique I discovered in Japan for people to set goals to demand of themselves to be really great in life. Now, Norman, your was it the first book you you published was the Green Book with Shingo. That was the, the no. The first book was Fukuda's book uh, called Managerial Engineering, and it's also a great book. You can you might be able to get it on the internet. Managerial Engineering. Fukuda wrote. He was a genius. He wrote a couple of great books. He wrote another one called Building Organizational Fitness. You can also get it on Amazon. I have no connection to productivity, so buy the book. I don't get anything from, from it, but it's great books to read. The second book that I got was Shingo, because Shingo spent his own money, and his son did the translation and put it in English. And Japan Management Association published the book for him called The Green Book. And I was probably the, fir- the first person in the world to find it. <laughs> it's a miracle in my life. I'm like a magnet. I go to Tokyo. After I was introduced, I was given this sheet of paper with the title on it. I called the Japan Management Association. I said, what is this? They said, this is a new book by Dr. Shingo in English. I said to my group, all of them, how many of you want the book? Only Jack Warren and myself wanted the book. So I ordered two copies. And Jack and I did the same thing on the plane coming back. It took about 10 hours. And we both read the book. And we both did the exact same thing. We both bought 500 copies from Japan Management. Jack bought 500 copies because it's the cheapest, easiest way to educate your people that we don't do. We, he bought 500 books. And he gave those books to every engineer in his company and to every manager and to every supervisor how to read that book. And they all read it in groups. They would read one chapter and then talk for a half an hour or so. How could we use this information at Omar? They read the book. Believe it or not, Chris, Omar became the best lean company in America, if not the world outside of Japan. They eliminated 90% of their inventory just by reading that book. They used to have 11 plants. They closed two of the plants because they had so much extra space. And then I brought Shingo to them. And once a year, right, probably for the next 10 years, Shingo would always visit Omar, and Omar has established their own Shingo prize back then, and they awarded the prize to the best plant every year. And Shingo would come to one plant, one visit, and one next plant, the next visit. I have so many funny, let me give you one a funny story about Shingo. Shingo was a consultant to Toyota, probably the greatest management consultant of the last hundred years. He was an industrial engineer. He was the seed of the ideas that came to Ono to develop the Toyota production system. Shingo was such an incredible genius in the things that he did. Well, I brought him to America. I met Shingo. After I found the Green Book and I bought 500 copies, I then went to Japan and miraculously, I met Shingo in Japan. I walk over to him. He's sitting in a wheelchair at a conference. And I said, Shingo, my name is Norman Bodek. And he looks at me and then he looks down. Why does he look down? There's an old saying, all Gaijin look the same. All foreigners look the same. It took him a few few minutes, and then finally said, ah, bodek son. And he remembered that I bought so many books from him. And then I said to Shingo, I want to bring you to America. I never did this before. I want to bring you to America. Shingo, well, how can I come to America? I'm in a wheelchair. I said, Shingo, you'll figure it out. And he came to America maybe at least 15 times to speak at my conferences and to go to, and to, go to various companies like Omar. Shingo was an amazing man. Oh, no, one day 
about 1955, Toto was going bankrupt. They had no cash. They went to the bank. The bank would not lend them any money. Toto didn't know what to do to, to survive. Ono noticed miraculously, we probably have three months worth of inventory on the factory floor. We have three months of inventory in the factory. He says, if I can get rid of that inventory, if I can reduce the inventory, I have all the cash we need to survive. Now, before I went to Japan, 1980, I went to Oldsmobile in Tarrytown, New York, to look at there. I've never been to a Oldsmobile pl a pl plant like that. When I went to the plant, they were making 1,000 automobiles a day, 500 in two shifts, 500 in each shift. Well, on the factory floor, they had a thousand of everything, a thousand hoods. They had, uh, you know what I mean, 4,000 doors. They had 5,000 tires. They had a thousand engines. They had inventory stacked all over the place. They also had a railroad car <laughs> there with another thousand parts. In fact, they had five days of inventory stacked up so that the plant would never shut down. I then go to Toyota three months later on my study mission in Japan, on my first trip. And I walk into the factory. Believe it or not, Chris, I see 18 engines on the floor. 18 engines on the floor. That means every 20 minutes or so, a new shipment came in with 18 new engines. They didn't need a 1,000 parts on the factory floor. They didn't need a warehouse. Jingo figured out how to get rid of that inventory. Oh, also, it has a thousand. Toyota had only eighteen because what they did was just in time, and Shingo played the key role in getting the cash. Because Ono says, "Look, I have three months of inventory. How do I get this down?" Ono went to a supermarket, and and, and the supermarket, he said, "Mrs. Housewife goes to a shelf, and she takes off the items that she needs, and then the supermarket immediately wants to restack that shelf." So the supermarkets have very little inventory, but the job of a supermarket is how do we quickly replenish? And Ono said, why can't I do the same thing in my factory? Why do we need all this inventory? Comes back and he goes to Shingo one day, because Shingo was his consultant. Shingo was Ono's advisor. Ono called Shingo, because Shingo was very famous as a great industrial engineer teacher. And he says, I need your help. And he says to Shingo, problem that I have is I want to reduce inventory. In order to do that, I have to reduce the time that it takes to change over these presses. Now, some of these presses, believe it or not, Chris, took 40 hours to make a changeover. But Ono pointed to one press. He says, look, it's taking four hours to change over that press. Because it's taking four hours, we have to stamp out 5,000 parts before we change, change it over again. Because economically, we can't change the die for between every part or every hundred parts. It's too expensive. I want you to see if you can get it down. And Shingo said brilliantly, brilliantly, he said, okay. How many people would say, okay, when it's taking four hours to do it, and they've been taking four hours for the last 10 years? Shingo said, okay. And Shingo just sat. This is an irony. I know of no consultant I don't know of a single company in America that calls a consultant and says, come in and just sit and watch and tell me what to do. We don't do that. We don't. Do, it only happened to me once in my life. I was in Tokyo visiting a friend of mine, which is Dr. Noriako Kano. He's very famous, Dr. Kano. He invented what's called the Kano quality model. It's a very famous model on quality. And I went to see him. He was speaking at a conference. And while I was there, an Indian gentleman comes over to me and he says, Norman, I want to introduce myself to you. My name is Ravino Srinivasan. I'm the chairman of TVS Motor. TVS Motor is a $9 billion company in India. <laughs> in India, so it means close to 30, 40 billion in America. And, and I said, I know TVS. You were my first client 30 years ago. He says, Norman, yes, I was your first client. I was really embarrassed because I didn't know him. It only took him 10 minutes to invite me and my wife to go to India. I've been there three times. I said, what do you want me to do? You want me to teach the Harada method? He says, no, I don't want you to teach anything. I just want you to come over and look at my plant. 
That was amazing. And I did. I just went over, looked at his plant, and then gave advice. He also introduced me to the world's greatest charity. He, he, Vino, of course, he's a very rich man with this company. And India has 650 people with no toilets, 650 million people with no toilets. More than half the population in India is living in poverty. They don't educate women, not at all, in, the, in these poverty areas. And Vino says, I'm going to do something about this. And he hired a couple of consultants, and they went into a village. And they got together, not the men, but they got together the women. And they said to the woman, what can we do that you can start to make money? Because the woman didn't make money. They stayed at home. Well, maybe they did knitting, you know, things like that. But most of the women stayed home and did the cooking and raised the family. And they lived in their shacks. And he and these con consultants said, what can we do? Well, I went and visited 15 of those cities. And I wrote a book on this. This is, this is interesting. I went to... Three factories. These were in a, each factory was fifteen women. They were all partners together, and they made Indian bread, the flat bread. So there were three factories there with fifteen in each. The women are partners; they share in the profits. And then I visited their city, and now they were living in brick houses, and they all had running water, and they all had electricity, and they all had toilets. It's amazing what people can do when you harness their energy. Now. India has something marvelous that we haven't had in America. Maybe we do now, but they have what's called micro banks, and they're willing to lend you $15. They don't do this in, in, in American banks. They would lend these women very little, and the women would have to save. They didn't care, these consultants, if they only saved 10 cents a week, but they had to set up a bank account and save and the bank would let them put in a few dollars a week in saving. And from this process, they learned the art of saving. They learned the art of running a business. And Vino's group called Srinivasan Services Trust has uplifted 3.2 million people out of poverty. Imagine, Chris, what American industry can do. Imagine what this 181 corporations can do if they're really serious about becoming socially responsible. I hope so. This yes. is just one example of what one corporation can do by helping people help themselves. This is what I love about the Harada method. That's what I teach. I teach people how to help themselves. You pick a goal. What do you want in this life? Don't tell me you don't want anything. Don't tell me you don't have a goal. If you don't want anything, and if you don't have a goal, you're not going to go anywhere. You have to start off and break through your own resistance and pick what do you want in this life. I don't care what you want. That's up to you. This concludes part two of the three-part series with Norman Bodek, the godfather of lean. In part three, we learn about the white book, 5S, and the downside of mass production.